everyone, this is Tholin and we have another emulation video for the Retroid Pocket 2. This is a special video, we are going to uh, check a specific category of games, a specific genre of games, but let's pause right here and let's go back a lot of decades now to the 90s to have a quick history update on what was happening in gaming back then and then we will continue with our emulation. Now back then, especially in the early 90s, gaming was split in two major categories. There were the consoles, which were dominated by those two guys, with Nintendo and its Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and with Sega and its Genesis or Sega Mega Drive. The second category of gaming back then was that of the computers. Now, there were mainly three types of computers that were utilized for gaming back then, excluding uh, the uh, Mac ones, the Apple ones, and that was the personal computers, the uh, Amiga uh, computers, uh, mainly the Amiga 500, 600 and later models, and of course the Atari ST system. Now, in the latter category, the gaming back then was dominated by a single type of games, a single genre, let's say, and that type was adventure games. Of course, there were a lot of other types of uh, releases like platforming, some ports uh, from uh, consoles, a lot of RPGs, but the big names back then were the adventure game releases. Of course, this category of games was not invented in the 90s, it began back in the middle and late 80s, but during the 1990s it was that time that the production value and the production quality of adventure games was improved. There were a lot of companies that were producing these types of games and of course they were dominating the computer gaming scene. Now, during the early 90s, most of the adventure games, most of the big names in the adventure games genre were being produced by two major players. I'm talking about Sierra or Sierra Entertainment or Sierra Online and LucasArts or Lucasfilm Games because they have changed a lot of uh, names uh, throughout uh, this period. Of course there were other companies but most of the big hits back then were being developed and produced and released by those two key players. Now those two companies, especially Sierra, is not present anymore. LucasArts is now mostly a licensing, uh, a game licensing uh, department or subsidiary of the big uh, corporate entity that is LucasArts, now under Disney, of course. And the rest of the companies that we will see um, their games in this video are not present. So this will be the focus of this video. We will take a look at uh, the adventure game a genre that was so popular back in the 90s and we will focus on that type. I have a small montage of what is to come in this video. You are going to see a couple of games that we are going to check. Of course there are a lot of games that we are going to review, 14 of them, but have a look at this montage and we will be back to our normal video. So that was a small glimpse of what is coming up in the actual video. 
Now, uh, the LucasArts games that uh, you saw in the, that video uh, utilized an engine called SCAM coming from Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion. Maniac Mansion was one of the early adventure games by LucasArts but most of the later games, most of the production by LucasArts utilized that particular system uh, to um, control and to uh, handle your game. Now, uh, this was the penultimate system for the point and click adventures back in the day. And later on, a new project emerged from uh, fans, actually, which was called Scam VM. That was, uh, let's say, an emulation of those old uh, LucasArts games in order to preserve them and to make them available for a wider variety of systems. Scam VM evolved to not only include the LucasArts games, but most of the successful and popular adventure games of back in the day. So in our video, we are going to focus on ScamVM emulation and how to set it up on the Retroid Pocket 2 along with the actual review and gameplay of 14 different adventure games. So on with the actual video and sorry for this interruption, but since this is a special guide, I wanted to give you the context of what we are going to see today. So we are now back to our normal video. And as already mentioned, we are going to focus on ScamVM. Now, ScamVM is a system that you can also uh, use as a core in RetroArch. You can download uh, the uh, ScamVM core as you uh, see here. You just go to downloads and then it's ready to be applied. Now, the problem is that you have, uh, first of all, to load the core and then also run the core. Uh, this will take you to another let's say, environment inside RetroArts, which will help you set up uh, the actual emulation. Um, I will not li don't really like the um, type of emulation that is offered through RetroArts, so we are going to uh, have uh, our emulation through the actual um, application of ScamVM. Uh, this is also pre-installed in the uh, Retroid Pocket 2, so you can find it uh, more or less next to the RetroArts uh, icon. Now, since ScamVM is an emulation for MS-DOS games, there is a, a step that you need to take uh, in order for the system to um, recognize and import your games. Now, you would download your games in RAR on, or uh, ZIP form, as you would normally do, but then you will have to extract each of those compressed files into a folder with a specific name uh, in order for ScamVM to recognize it. And that name depends on the actual game. Um, I'm going to show you and I'm also going to have the link of that uh, spreadsheet. There is a spreadsheet that contains all these names and I'm going to show you uh, the case of Loom, for instance. Here you open uh, WinRAR you select your Loom um, uh, compressed file and then you should extract it into a folder that is called Loom, all uh, lowercase characters. And this way and only this way, uh, ScamVM will recognize the game and then you can uh, have it as an option to import it. Now, as you can see, I have already uh, started extracting the um, file to Loom folder and when this process is finished you can we can go back to ScamVM and import the game. I'm going as already mentioned to have the actual link for the spreadsheet in the description of this video so it will be very easy for you to uh, find out which folder name you should use for every one of the games that are supported by ScamVM. Now the game is extracted at its appropriate folder and then we can run ScamVM and then add the game. It's this icon here, you select it and then you go to the actual folder, in our case Loom, and select Choose. As you can see, it shows the game and after I click OK, I will have this game available in my list. You don't have to do that every time, you just do it once in order to import all the, all the games you want. We are now ready to start with our first game and we begin 
of course, with an iconic game of back in the day. Uh, let's say a cyberpunk game by Revolution Software, a company that we will also uh, see again in the uh, remaining video. And this game is called Beneath a Still Sky. Uh, there are no particular settings that you need to change in ScamVM in order for uh, those types of games to uh, play, but you can pause your game using uh, the appropriate keys, Y in this case, and go to options to see the available options that you may have. In some games you can uh, change uh, to uh, only text or only uh, audio or voice because those games that we are going to um, check here are the CD versions of the games and they have full speeds. Now as for the game, it was developed by the British company uh, Revolution Software which is famous uh, for other adventure games like the Broken Sword series and uh, Beneath the Steel Sky uh, was developed with the support of Dave Gibbons uh, who is a comic illustrator, a graphic novel illustrator famous for illustrating uh, Watchmen, the Watchmen series. Now, uh, this game is set in a dystopian future uh, when you assume the role of uh, Robert Foster uh, who is uh, stranded in a wasteland that reminds Australia. Uh, this wasteland is called The Gap and as a child he is adopted by the local uh, aboriginals uh, adjusting gradually to the uh, wilderness. After many years uh, some armed security forces arrive killing the locals and taking back Robert to the uh, megalopolis let's say, uh, the Union City. He then escapes and uh, tries to uh, deal with the uh, corruption that is taking place in the city. The game starts with a full speech uh, intro in a graphic novel style. This is also developed by Charles Cecil who is very famous in the adventure game uh, series. He is also the creator of uh, The Broken Sword as already mentioned. And After the introduction this is the actual gameplay of uh, Beneath a Steel Sky, a typical point and click adventure when you use your cursor and moving it to the top uh, part of the screen you can see your actual inventory. You can interact with the um, items that are available on the screen and we will see how you do that. And you can click on every uh, different, let's say, location in the screen for your character to walk there. As you can see when you have an, uh, an item that you can interact with, you ca the cursor changes to a cross and you can uh, press the second button which is now case is B to pick up this item. Now this item is available at your inventory and you can move, for instance here we can move to the door, you can go to your inventory. Uh, you can change also any uh, settings that are available or load or save your game. Uh, from here. Uh, uh, let's resume. But now that we have uh, the actual uh, crowbar, let's say, you select it from your inventory and then as you can see the cursor has changed to uh, your item and you can click where you want to use it and your character will use it there. Now using that rod we managed to open the door the guard has noticed us and he will follow us uh, to the upper side of the screen. Uh, this, is, as you can see, it has beautiful graphics, uh, hand-drawn um, cyberpunk graphics and uh, you will be able to enjoy all those games that you can see here in a big screen by simply using the um, mini HDMI to HDMI cable that comes with Retroid Pocket 2 and also you can use the actual USB-C adapter to install a mouse and enjoy uh, those games to their fullest because the best way to enjoy point and click adventures is through uh, the mouse. Now uh, we can go to our second game and have a look on what is coming up. We have again Revolution Software and Charles Cecil and this is the most famous uh, series by this company. We are talking of course about Broken Sword and the first installment in this series which is called The Shadow of the Templars. 
Now this is again a point and click adventure game and it has magnificent graphics and excellent animation as you can already see and uh, you don't lose much by playing that on the small screen of uh, Retroid Pocket 2 but again you can enjoy it in a full screen mode by using an external monitor. I'm going to skip the introduction to avoid any spoilers and you can have a look at how it actually looks in game. Now this is your character, you wake up after an explosion in a cafe in Paris and it is a typical again point and click, it doesn't have a lot of options to change also uh, you will find the actual voice, you can find the actual subtitles also um, available uh, in this case, in this game you can jump to the actual uh, settings and the actual uh, options that are available by uh, using the uh, button X in your uh, Retroid Pocket 2 and this button will pop up uh, another type of menu as you will see now. Now from here again you can save or load your state, you can uh, change the uh, appearance of text or not in your uh, gameplay and then go back to the actual gameplay. Now as you can see uh, all the graphics are hand drawn, the locations are excellent, they are based on actual uh, locations in Paris and this is one of the most beautiful games that you can find for the MS-DOS. It was released quite late in the uh, adventure game era let's say of MS-DOS or personal computer gaming and on the top you will uh, find your uh, your inventory as it was in Beneath the Steel Sky. The uh, gameplay is excellent, also the way you handle your characters and you interact with the environment and the items is amazing. There is no problem at all to enjoy this game as it, uh, at its fullest. And please do, it has an amazing story. Uh, especially if you like those type of stories like the uh, Da Vinci Code and all this stuff. This was um, a game that has a lot of conspiracies behind it. There are more or less, if I'm not mistaken, five Broken Sword games and you can even find the last one, Broken Sword 5, uh, for the Nintendo Switch. It was produced uh, after a successful Kickstarter campaign. But it all started with this one, which is the first Broken Sword game. And I suggest you try it and enjoy it before uh, moving on to the rest uh, of the Broken Sword series. We are ready to move on though to our third game of this uh, video guide. And this game is Day of the Tentacle. Now, The Day of the Tentacle is actually the second part of Maniac Mansion. Uh, Maniac Mansion was the first game to utilize the uh, previously mentioned SCAM uh, engine or system. And uh, Day of the Tentacle is actually Maniac Mansion 2. It is an amazingly funny game with a lot of uh, comedy uh, involved, especially in its dialogues and also in its characters. It has the theme of, uh, let's say, uh, pollution, the global pollution, uh, some alien tentacles and also some uh, bit crazy scientists that are behind all that. The characters are rich and funny and I suggest you get the CD-ROM version of the game which has full speech uh, support and uh, the voice talents that were utilized for this game were great. Now, when you exit the, uh, in the introduction and you go to the options, you can uh, here select the text and speech also, which in my case is the best way to enjoy it as I want to have uh, both text and the actual uh, voices. Now, when you exit the um, uh, introduction, you will get to use the typical SCAM user interface. And what I mean in that is that the, let's say, three uh, quarters of the screen is where the action is and on the bottom 25% uh, let's say of the screen are the available options that you can use. In this case you have the give, pick up, use, open, look uh, and the other options and on the right side of that uh, part is your actual inventory. So everything that you will pick up you will see them at the lower uh, right side of the screen. 
you can for instance use you can pick use and then point with your uh, mouse cursor at the item that you want to use you can do the same uh, to open to pick up uh, and everything when you are actually um, moving your cursor over an item you will see a pre-selected action with a different color in your user interface that you can press b and the game will automatically execute this action for instance if i press here uh, b it will look at uh, the selected uh, item now uh, day of the tentacle is a must for adventure uh, games fans and most of the games that you are going to see this video game uh, guide are uh, must for adventure players it runs without any issues on scam vm and again i suggest you enjoy it on a big screen uh, mostly because of uh, the text and a bit of um, because of the actual design of the screens some of the items may not be that visible in a small display like the one of retroid pocket 2 so you may have to move to a bigger display to a bigger screen to enjoy it to its fullest for our fourth game in this video, we bring out the big guns. This is The Dig, another game by LucasArts that show the high production values of the adventure games back in the 90s. That was uh, released in 1995 and it was actually uh, based on a, an idea about a Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, this idea was never turned into a movie, of course, but it was turned into an actual video game, an adventure game, and we are talking about The Dig. Now, in contrary to other LucasArts uh, releases, The Dig took a somber approach to its science fiction motif. It doesn't include any uh, typical humor other than some sub uh, subtle humor that you can find in the dialogues. In the game, the player takes the role of Commander Boston Lowe, uh, who is uh, part of a five-man team uh, with the actual target to plant explosives on an asteroid uh, that has uh, a course a collision course with uh, earth now they discover that the asteroid is hollow and the low and two of his team are transported to a long abandoned complex filled with alien advanced technology on a strange alien world now this is an amazing story an excellent uh, graphics that shows uh, what the personal computers of the mid-90s could uh, do. Again, the animations are hand-drawn, there are tons of uh, dialogues and of areas that you need to explore. Again, this uses the SCAM engine, but a more updated one, you do not have uh, any part of the screen that uh, is black, as you saw in the previous game, but uh, the actual point and click action happens on the main gameplay screen and you can also see some extra items of your inventory or some dialogue options on the screen again. Now I don't want to spoil any other part of this story, it is an amazing uh, adventure game and a great uh, story behind it. It's no coincidence that they wanted to make that into a movie, but they didn't, and so we have this amazing adventure game called The Dig. Again, this version is the CD-ROM uh, version of the game where you have uh, text and full speech support. There is some great voice uh, acting uh, in the game, uh, and it includes some well-known um, actors like uh, Robert Patrick and Steve Blum. Also, the uh, original score, the soundtrack of uh, Dig is amazing as they have uh, used a full orchestra. That was not typical of the production quality that you would find in adventure games. Again, the Dig stood out as a great, uh, let's say, blockbuster game of back in the day. Now for our fifth game, we have selected a hidden gem of the era. I'm talking about I have no mouth and I must scream. Now this is again a dystopian a cyberpunk let's say adventure game that was developed um, it was also based and uh, developed with the assistant of Harlan J. Ellison. Now uh, Harlan J. Ellison 
was an American writer known for his influential work on new wave speculative fiction. He wrote a big number of short stories, books or novellas, more than 1700 of them. And this game it was based on a short story by uh, Harlan Ellison, which was also called I Have No Mouth and I Must uh, Scream. The game uh, takes place in a dystopian future where a mastermind artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence uh, named AM has uh, destroyed all of humanity except for five people whom he has been keeping alive and torturing for more than a hundred years. He is torturing them by constructing uh, metaphorical adventures based on each character uh, fatal flaws. So this game uh, has uh, a lot to do about decisions through ethical dilemmas that deal with issues like insanity, paranoia and genocide. The actual script of this game was produced by the writer, by Harlan Ellison, uh, Ellison and it was uh, developed by a company called the Dreams Guild, which is uh, not active anymore. Uh, the soundtrack also was commissioned to a film composer, John Ottman, and the game was not a big commercial success, mostly due to its uh, theme and its dark atmosphere but the ones who have played it and I have played it back in the day found that game amazing and it is. Uh, this is an adult game it's not ideal for um, young kids or whatever but you will enjoy the story it is quite unique there are not a lot of uh, similar games that show the inner struggle of the character also of the characters also there are uh, five different characters as already mentioned each with his different characteristics and traits and the whole journey of the story is how uh, you interact with um, and you manage your own ethical dilemmas it is a great uh, adventure it is a great game that uh, i really suggest that you uh, pick it up and enjoy it you will not find something similar like that even though it is a now a 25 year old game uh, it's a concept uh, that you won't find in a lot of games and again it's a unique hidden gem of the personal computer gaming era of the uh, adventure games uh, genre that I suggest you pick up and enjoy. For our sixth game we go back to the blockbusters and another LucasArts game. Now uh, this is Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Uh, LucasArts has uh, decide, had decided uh, to make another one of its famous franchises into an adventure game and again they uh, had a high qu production value for this game. Uh, it has as it is the CD-ROM uh, version of the game, it has full speed support. It's uh, the speech of the main character, Indiana Jones, is not uh, by uh, Harrison Ford, though. Uh, there is uh, another voice actor. But other than that, it is also a great story. It will uh, remind uh, to a lot of uh, you the uh, story behind the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It is uh, quite similar actually as Indiana Jones is looking for the lost continent of Atlantis as it, uh, this continent was described in ancient uh, scriptures of uh, the uh, ancient Greek uh, philosopher Plato. Now uh, again the animation is hand drawn it still uses the uh, SCAM uh, engine but the more updated version as seen in the dig. Uh, here it is a pure uh, point and click adventure that with all the action taking uh, place in the full uh, available screen. Your character moves around by uh, you clicking on the location you want him uh, to move and when there is an, uh, an item that you can interact with uh, you can see that on your mouse cursor. Now as you can see uh, everything is beautifully uh, drawn this is the VGA version of the game and it looks amazing, especially uh, to me because I remember playing that in my 286 uh, computer with a black and white EGA screen 
And believe me, that was tough back in the day uh, to recognize what was happening in the screen and to identify the items that you had to interact with. But in the VGA, this is full color. I believe it's 256 uh, colors that are simultaneously on, on the screen and you can enjoy it again. Uh, the Indiana Jones uh, theme, of course, is uh, composed by John Williams and is available in the game. But other than that, it has a typical um, Indiana Jones story where you travel to a lot of locations, where you meet a lot of characters in order to solve that mystery of the lost continent of Atlantis. For our next game, we have The Legend of Kinandia Book 3 Malcolm's Revenge. Now, that, was, uh, that adventure game was developed by another studio, uh, specifically by Westwood, the company who is famous for the uh, Command and Conquer series of uh, real-time uh, strategy uh, games. And this is the third installment to the Legend of Kirandia series or the Fables and Fiends uh, series of games. It is a typical uh, point and click adventure and uh, in this game you assume the role of the antagonist from the first game in the series who begins plotting his uh, revenge against those who imprisoned him. Now, in uh, Malcolm's uh, Revenge, the game differs from its uh, predecessors as it includes a point-based system which awards points for performing specific actions during the game and also a laughter track when the protagonist performs or makes comedic references. In addition, the player can also switch the protagonist between three personalities, truthful, normal and deceitful, in which the right personality can help him uh, solve uh, some of the game's puzzles. Now, uh, the game received mixed reviews on its release and had uh, small uh, sales, mostly due to the shift of the focus of Westwood uh, Studios to the Command and Conquer series and rather than the quality of the game. The game is excellent, the animations and the comedy, uh, let's say, um, part of the dialogues is excellent and it is another of the hidden gems the whole trilogy of the legend of Kirandia is a hidden gem with regards to adventure games from the personal computer era and I suggest you try it it has great characters and it has also a very nice story a bit crazy story that you need to follow and pick up uh, from the first game of the series for our eighth game in this video, we see switch to the other juggernaut of the adventure games genre, and I'm talking about Sierra, of course, a studio responsible for a numerous uh, hits or adventure games back in the day, and this is Leisure Suit Larry Seven Love for Sale. Now, the um, Leisure Suit uh, series of adventure games is a comedy. Uh, type of games, uh, mostly adult humor though, that they were developed by Al Lowe, a legendary adventure game uh, creator, let's say. And this is actually the sixth game uh, in the series. Uh, it was called uh, Laser Suite Larry 7 because there was no uh, Laser Suite Larry 4. And that was uh, done intentionally, of course. It was also the last game that was developed uh, with the involvement of Al Lowe, as this series was, uh, uh, let's say, reintroduced to the public in uh, 2018 with the uh, release of uh, Leisure Sweet Larry Wet Dreams Don't Dry. But this game uh, has nothing to do with the original series other than the, other than the use of uh, Larry Laffer, the main uh, character, and uh, Al Lowe was not involved in that. Now, uh, this game has excellent graphics, again, hand-drawn, and when it was released, it was released as part of the big box uh, PC games release. It also had a um, scratch card, as I remember, inside the package, and depending on which screen of the game you were, there was a small colored rectangle, let's say, 
on the bottom side of the screen that indicated which part of the scratch, uh, let's say, card you had to scratch and smell uh, to uh, help you, let's say, immerse with the game. But it was a great extra uh, of uh, back in the day when the releases of PC games were more than the, than a single uh, DVD or CD-ROM. It has, again, full speech and a great... Um, let's say user interface you mostly interact with the items that you see on the screen you pick up and then you can see your inventory go to your inventory uh, select the item you want and use that full speed support of course as again this is a cd-rom release and with one of the best characters especially in the comedy uh, adventure games that you can find i'm talking of course about larry laffer the uh, guy who always tries to pick up the to pick up girls he always ends up in situations like the one you see on the screen right now our next game is again a lucas art game i'm talking about loom and this is my personal favorite adventure game of all time now again here in the options you can uh, include text and subs as uh, this is again the CD-ROM version with full speed support. Now this game uh, utilized a very unique uh, user interface. You, it was actually a combination of point and click and music. As you progress in the game you pick up uh, your own let's say stuff uh, and then you learn different notes as you evolve your, your character. Depending on the item you interact, you learn some small, let's say, arrangements with those notes, some small jingles. For instance, if you click on an open door, you will hear three different notes that are, is the action, the actual jingle for open. So whenever you see a closed door, you can play those three notes on your staff and the, the door with, uh, will open. Again, it is a very unique user interface again you will have the typical three quarters of the screen available for the actual action of the game and the, le the rest remains for the uh, user interface where you have your music sheet let's say and your uh, items and you use that to enjoy the game's excellent uh, fantasy based story that has to do with the weavers of time, of time and space, and some apprentice magician. You assume the role of, a, of an apprentice magician in a very peculiar and strange fantasy world. Uh, really, this is one of the absolute gems of the adventure games genre, a unique game in, it, in itself and especially in this edition which is the full speech and VGA version of the game, you will enjoy it to, the, to its fullest. Honestly, if you want to try one of the games of this video, I suggest you pick up Loom. It is a great and unique game and... Uh, I believe that especially if you are a fan of the adventure games, this is one of the games that you should have in your library and you have completed it. For our 10th game of this video, we remain on the fantasy genre, but we go back to Sierra and this is Quest for Glory 3, Wages of War. Now this is the third installment in the Quest for Glory uh, series of games. It is um, a typical fantasy RPG but it is set up in a different, not that common environment because it's not th that many forests or, uh, forests or snowy peaks. It takes place in a location that resembles Africa. It uh, also um, has a lot of uh, influences from the African, let's say, uh, stories, mythology and literature, but it is the single game uh, that I haven't managed to uh, properly run on ScamVM. And the problem here is that after you start your game and you create your character, you have to give him a name. And in order to do that, uh, the um, ScamVM switches to the actual touch screen, um, let's say, uh, user interface or touch screen keypad. The problem is that the Retroid Pocket 2 does not support uh, the touch screen, so you cannot uh, type in or 
let's say click on the actual letters to give a name to your character so you cannot progress what you can do though and i'm going to uh, do that and have an update in the comments below is create your character in a, let's say a scan vm on a mobile or a, on a tablet where you can use your uh, the virtual let's say keyboard and then import that character into a scan vm on retroid pocket 2 so this is what we are going to do and i'm going to have an update for that on the actual uh, comments of the video other than that the game is playable but you have to uh, find a workaround uh, for the problem that you will face by not being able to give a name to your character our next game is loosely let's say related to sierra also as it was uh, developed by tsunami a company founded by ex sierra employees and this game is the return to ring world now this game uh, is the sequel to the previous game based on larry neven's uh, series of novels with the same title ring world and again is it is a point and click adventure and puzzle solving game that takes place in space after saving the puppeteer race from extermination and uncovering some powerful ancient technology on the first game queen seeker of vengeance and miranda reese find themselves searched as fugitives by all three major species so they um, go to ringworld to hide once in Ringworld, they'll uh, try to uncover some evidence to uh, clear their names, but they will also stumble across another universe-threatening plot. Now, this game is uh, way bigger than the previous one, and again, it takes place in space. It has a unique, let's say, uh, user interface which is mostly point and click you have your cursor as you move around uh, your area or your location and depending on uh, what uh, you interact with depending on the object you can find a specific set of uh, let's say actions that you can take on this triangle as you see here some of them is uh, speak to open pick up and uh, all these things again this is a very nice game that follows the ringworld series of novels and it is not a very uh, well known uh, adventure game but again it i would categorize it as a hidden gem especially if you like space operas for our 12th uh, game in this video we return to a classic and this is sam and max hit the road by lucasarts now this is a 2d uh, point and click adventure again and it was released originally in 1993 it has a, a 2002 uh, re-release as a uh, remake let's say and it's based on the comic characters of uh, sam and max two characters created by steve purcell uh, originally debuted in a 1987 comic, uh, comic book uh, series this game is based on one of those uh, of the adventures uh, of those uh, two comic characters and especially on the case of a missing bigfoot from a nearby uh, carnival now uh, this was developed during 1992 and uh, the from lucasarts who utilized the same scam engine from uh, maniac mansion and monkey island adventure titles now the uh, series creator Steve Purcell was a LucasArts employee back in the day and he was one of the lead uh, designers in the project. The animations, the characters are uh, excellent. Uh, also the design is amazing. As you can see uh, you have animation in the speech of the characters and also you have facial expressions. Whatever you decide to do with your characters you will have the appropriate animation which is again amazing and shows the quality and the production value of LucasArts adventure games back in the day. Now again this is a funny uh, game that you can also find um, in uh, recent systems. We are also expecting a Nintendo Switch uh, release of uh, this game and as you can see it has an updated let's say version of the scam engine as you uh, you have the full screen available for gameplay and you can switch uh, 
to your action icons and uh, interact with the items and the location. As you can see here, uh, this is the um, take or use uh, icon that changes from an open to a close fist depending on what uh, you want to do and what you want to interact with. You can also switch to using other your other character. You can switch between Sam and Max and depending on the, the character you use, you can have different interactions with the items in order for you to solve the necessary puzzles and progress in the game. Especially in the PC CD-ROM version of the game where you have full speech, the voice acting is amazing, they have used excellent voices for your characters and also for the other characters that you will come across and interact throughout your game. Moving on, you cannot have a video with uh, adventure games and not have a Monkey Island title in it. This is the secret of Monkey Island, one of the most famous adventure games ever. That was uh, developed by LucasArts and it was published in 1990 and it was conceived in 1988 by LucasArts uh, film employee Ron Gilbert who designed it with the legendary Tim Safer and Dave Grossman, the people who are also behind the design of the Scam engine. This game actually utilizes a modified SCAM engine and that was done because uh, during development uh, Ron Gilbert was uh, a bit fed up with the Sierra adventure games where your character would die and made it impossible for your character to die on Monkey Island so the focus is on exploration and of course on the characters now the characters of, of this game are amazing there is a lot of humorous moments and uh, humorous dialogues throughout the game and also it has a very unique way of fencing let's say as your uh, character your main character learns how uh, to fence there is a specific uh, system where he uses let's say uh, phrases or uh, sentences to insult his uh, foes or adversaries and based on the selection of those sentences you can win or lose your match. Now other than that it's uh, based on a fictionary uh, let's say a Caribbean environment and it was heavily influenced by the Pirates of the Caribbean theme park ride. Uh, this game was the fifth uh, built with Scam Engine and the early releases, especially the uh, DOS uh, floppy disk releases, had a cardboard wheel which was called Dial a Pirate when you would uh, turn the wheel to uh, mix the uh, upper face and the lower face of a pirate in order to answer the copy protection question before you start your game. Now this game is of course a legendary adventure game and as you can see it has the typical scam engine and a lot of dialogues. This is a dialogue heavy game that focuses on humorous interactions with characters. Of course if you haven't played any of the Monkey Island adventure games this is the game to start. For our 14th and final game in this video, we have another one of my favorite adventure games. This was developed by AdventureSoft and we are talking about Simon the Sorcerer. Now, uh, AdventureSoft is a British company uh, that was uh, founded uh, by uh, Mike Woodruff and this game was actually a fantasy game but it was more, uh, more or less a parody of the actual uh, fantasy adventure games of back in the day, especially a parody of the Sierra games. It was also heavily influenced by works uh, such as the Discworld uh, series of books and games also, another British uh, series, and uh, the character is heavily inspired by another British staple character in the comedy genre and I'm talking about Black Adder. Now this game is amazingly uh, animated as you can see there are animations for the facial expressions of, of uh, Simon and for every character. This is of course again the CD-ROM version with full speed support but see how uh, the actual 
mouths move as the characters speak. Now the, the engine utilized is uh, very similar to the SCAMP engine. Again, you have all your available uh, options to interact with the environment and also with the locations. Uh, depending on the uh, where you click your uh, cursor will change you can also use your map in your inventory uh, to move uh, between locations and you can also um, use your postcard that is also located in your uh, inventory to save or load uh, the game now this is again a comedy adventure game there were um, five Simon the Sorcerer games released and there was also a sixth announced that was supposed to be funded through Kickstarter but I am not sure if that was ever uh, released. I don't believe it was ever released actually. Uh, again your character is Simon, an apprentice magician who uh, gets involved in all those uh, funny and comedic situations and uh, he has to solve a lot of puzzle, uh, puzzles. He is also accompanied by his dog Chippy who can help him in his adventures. Now that was all guys for our special video about adventure games of the early and mid 90s. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did please follow the channel thumb up as we have more content coming soon.